throw you a question on that one. Do you think this way of the future, these bitcoins or something, a, a new generation of? This may well be the case, um, but I think there's something worrying about the, the, the use of, of bitcoins or any other form of di digital currency. One of the things that binds us together as a society is, uh, is our commitment, uh, certain obligations and, and, and rules of, of how our currency actually works. Um, this bit, bitcoin, uh, uh, bitcoin business, um, one of the things about it is that it, it's free of politics, uh, it's free of any sense of obligation. Uh, to society, indeed any connection with society. It's, it's indeed, um, it's been described as being, uh, we know about Facebook being a social networking system as, as an anti-social networking system. Um, it's highly individualistic. And the concern is, in part, that while it's, it's pretty sinister, uh, drug dealing or, 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 or money laundering or whatever, there's also this, this inclination towards a highly individualistic society in, in which we can operate anonymously, uh, we're not, nothing is traceable, uh, we, we avoid paying taxes, we avoid exchange rates, we avoid a lot of the things that binds us together as a society. I so I do think it's quite a sinister thing. I think that's right. There's, there's a real libertarian streak here of separating your currency from government, from big banks, you know, sitting in your log cabin with your, with your gun uh, and separating yourself from society. And the economist Paul Krugman made the point that you can't actually separate money from society. Society makes money and what you do with it is what makes it money. So if you can't pay your taxes in it, then it's not going to work. And I think, you know, the dollar, the euro and the yen are safe today because any currency that loses up to 75% of its value in two days is probably not a very good holder of value. It's part of that outlaw culture of the web, isn't it? You know, I, I don't want to. I don't want to play by your rules. And of course, it's had a lot more uh, take up lately because of, you know issue, issues in Cyprus, Cyprus and so on, where where bank depositors are taking a haircut. So you, you can see it's a lure. But Kirk's right in saying that the answer will actually be to make doing what you normally do much easier. So when I travel offshore, it's a lot easier now to get New Zealand currency converted and you just pay with your credit card all over the place and so and on. And cheaper because it is those fees. If you use your credit card offshore, you know, they whack you. There's, there's right. fees all the way along. And, and there is, there's a reasonable pushback against that. Well, precisely. There? But the, the answer will, of course, be to make all of that more, more uh, accessible, cheaper, uh, and, and, and the, the banks will simply respond to that. And, of course, governments have got a big reason to, to assist them because to, to, they need to get tax paid and they want to make sure that, uh, that illegal transactions are minimised. Kirk made an interesting point, actually, that the supply of bitcoins is capped. Hmm. That actually makes it a very inflexible currency because the, the reason we don't have a gold standard anymore is that we sure. need to be able to control the supply of our money. So that means either we're, you know, playing around with interest rates or we're printing money or not. Or, uh, and if you can't do that, it's not going to work. Uh, it really is like the tulip mania in the 1600s in <laughs> Holland where everybody traded futures in tulip bulbs uh, until a sailor came along and thought it was an onion and ate it. And then suddenly everybody stopped believing that this was a currency you could use. <laughs> a great myth. So, yes. you know, money is a mutually shared illusion. They have to come up with a, a, another name. Um, I'm struggling with the term bitcoins, particularly at 9 o'clock on a Sunday morning. But one of the things that it, it, it does is it, it does require buy-in. I mean, you, you need to have people who are prepared to trade in it. Um, buying a coffee, um, paying your lawyer for whatever reason, because very often they, in some countries, receive money in kind. Um, but, you know, if, you, if you've got such a limited range of opportunities for actually trading with this currency, it's going to be very difficult. That's not to say it won't be replaced by something which is much larger. Because this could be the early, early one in there. Yeah. Interesting though, Phil, isn't it? People's psychology, if you like. The banks in Cyprus, so you buy bitcoins. Well, that's right. But, of course, in Europe, there's a, there's a real... Um, lack of confidence in, in banking. Not, it's not like here. I mean, we don't like banks, I guess. People don't like banks because apparently they make like too much fees. money and so on, right? We don't like fees. But there's a much different thing going on in Europe, which is a, a, an issue of confidence in banks themselves. Will they survive? Is my money going to be safe? So it's a very different cultural reason to drive bitcoins. But at the end of the day, I think it's just part of this outlaw piece of the web. It's, you know, I don't want to play by anybody's <laughs> rules. So it, at the end of the day, rules will win out because at the end of the day, money is a social mm. contract. Money's part of what you need to do. And if, right. if we're all going to sort of get, we're gonna move away from that social contract, all of a sudden you don't have schools and hospitals and roads and it all gets a bit hard. It's, it's backed up by the rule of law and if it's not, it's not really money. I mean, I've got a dishwasher uh, 
that's worth value and I can trade it, but it's not currency. Yes. So you, you have to, what you do with it makes it money, not what it looks like. Very so. good. We will leave it there, Pat.